the world is getting steadily urbanized. By estimates, over 55% of the human population now lives in urban areas, which will grow to 68% by 2050. This means that for the first time in human history, most humans live in a built environment rather than a natural one. India is also getting urbanized, with over 50% of India's population living in urban areas by 2030. And this will be primarily in the seven mega cities that have a population of over one crore by the end of the decade. The latest report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, paints a rather grim picture as it states that India is among the countries that is going to be most affected by climate change, with widespread flooding and ecosystem deterioration. Cities naturally will bear the maximum brunt of this, as they are densely populated. Hence, we need to relook at our cities from an ecological perspective, make them resilient, both for humans and non-humans living in them. Hello, my name is Kausto Brau. I'm faculty at Azim Premji University. Today on this episode of Plain Speak, we're going to talk about resilient cities. So what do we understand by resilience? How are people resilient and how are uh, cities resilient? It's the same way for both. It's the ability to recover from hardships and stand up and uh, prosper again. So today I'm very glad to have Harini uh, here with us to talk about this very important matter. So Harini, uh, shall we start with the IPCC report, which was recently published and is sure. in the news. Uh, what do we make of, of what the IPCC report is saying? So this, uh, I think, set of IPCC reports is pretty historic because we know, I think, much more than ever before that the world is in a crisis. And climate change is not just some distant future event that we have to prepare for at the end of the 21st century. It's all around us. And we see the disasters that are happening, right? So the first IPCC report in this batch series, the working group one, which came out some time ago, talked about the models of climate change. Right. This one talks about why it's so important for us to do something and what we should actually do. So what the report is actually saying is that uh, we need to focus on not just mitigation, that is reducing climate change, but also adapting to or being resilient to climate change. And so we need to scale up because climate change is a very unequal thing. Um, you know, for instance, there are estimates that say people in Africa who have barely contributed to climate change are going to face almost the same impact as people in Europe who have really, you know, in terms yeah, of their consumption and footprint contributed the most to climate change. So what this report is telling us is that we need to adapt and mitigate. And most of this adaptation has to be in cities because by 2050, close to 70% of the world will live in cities. So that's where the biggest disasters are going to take place in terms of you know, human impacts. And that's really where we need to do things. So if we were to step back a little bit and think about cities uh, at the very beginning, you know, cities began as uh, hubs for trade and commerce. And then things kind of naturally grew outwards from there. And there was never any vision of uh, ecology or the environment uh, when we looked at cities. So now where do we fit these visions uh, in, yeah. in our natural, modern imagining of the city? Yeah. So actually, I think what is interesting is the modern imaginations of the city as a place of concrete and highways and you know skyscrapers and in IT and finance has actually convinced us the cities of the past didn't have space for nature. But if you look at our own research in the university, for instance, research on Bangalore or Bombay or Kolkata or Delhi, you know, Delhi grew to be what it was because of the Yamuna River. Right? Right. And that was very critical for it. Yes. Bangalore uh, is a dry area which doesn't have uh, any water, any per perennial sources of water. So they created what the tanks that we call yes. lakes today. right? And that's how people actually survived. Or Bombay wouldn't have been Bombay without the coast. East Kolkata, I mean, uh, the East Kolkata wetlands managed the sewage of Kolkata. And because of that, Kolkata could actually grow and get out of this whole, you know, this danger of what, what does it do with its sewage and how does it manage its sewage. So they've always played with their ecology in very fundamental ways, right? And if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be where they were today. And uh, for instance, if you take Bangalore, as it grew over time, or Delhi as it grew over time, people planted a lot of trees. So the green cities that we see today are actually planted in these semi-arid environments because they knew that when you get people in these very dense areas with a lot of concrete, you need to cool them down and therefore you need trees. But our modern imaginations have changed, right? So yeah. that's, that's where we think that we don't need uh, nature in our cities. We think that 
we can do conservation outside the cities you can go for a trek on the weekends a city yes. is a place for roads and not for trees a city is not a place for endangered species and then you get the travesties of like mumbai you're building the second largest uh, uh, huge airport in mumbai on the navi mumbai wetlands and going to destroy flamingo habitat yes. and that airport is going to go underwater probably 10 years after it was built so it's it makes no economic sense and it makes no ecological sense so what you are saying is that actually the conception of a city uh, in connection with nature was very different in yeah. the past uh, than it is now so then what do we uh, what can we think of as nature in the city now like so i think we see so many things around us i mean uh, bangalore i was just recently looking at for instance has close to 30 species of bats 225 species of different kinds of birds right and if i think there are 12 million of us just one species homo sapiens sapiens <laughs> right and you know probably tens of thousands of different kinds of insects at the same time so we live with this biodiversity we don't see it we're oblivious to it yeah. uh, and uh, you know we need it for so many things i think covid has really taught us we need nature for stress relief all of us i think mental health issues have been such a huge fallout of the pandemic and nature is what kept most of us sane during you know just going for a walk in the park or seeing a squirrel or you know just feeling that you're not alone in this world but it's also other things you know people we've seen in our own research that people forage in the city so many people who are from low income communities who can't afford to buy let's say fish or you know other kinds of protein or uh, get greens because greens are so expensive so forage for plants to, around the lake they also forage for things for their medicinal uses or uh, you know oils that you like the honge seeds you can make oil from them so there's a lot of economic benefits of biodiversity and then there are issues like we were talking about shade you know yes. what what kind of like street vendors really depend on the streets uh, the trees next to the road for shade you know there's there's a range of benefits that you have nature in the city offering and it's that that we need to work around because we tend to think that we that we don't need biodiversity in our cities that we can manage with nature outside but it's really the nature in our cities that we need to assiduously nourish especially if we think of the fact that there's 67% of the world is going to live in these cities i mean yes. how are we going to actually manage to to live a decent life it's not just about the money we earn or the uh, or the malls that we can go to right we have to live well and to live yeah. well you need that connection so what you are saying seems to be very different uh, from what we see uh, in the government policies uh, for instance we have a whole smart city program which is very technology centric and has a lot of interventions yeah. of technology in the imagining of the city so what do you think about that i mean so there are a lot of issues with the smart city program but if you think of the issues with specifically related to ecology and the environment the plans themselves talk a lot about resilient cities you know that's some of something we discussed right in the beginning of this conversation right but if you look at the budgets they largely go to i mean we'll give you the example of port blair the plan for port blair which is extraordinarily sensitive to climate change because of it's a uh, coastal yeah. city is going to get flooded talks a lot about resilience to climate change but in the budget a lot of money goes for car parks for tourists to come in you know which is very <laughs> counterintuitive which means you have cement on the and yes. you're not going to whereas what you need is mangroves you need wetlands you need those kinds of places which are going to actually be a buffer against the sea it similarly in mangalore when we were doing some research on the kinds of smart city plans a lot of the plans seem like they are uh, going to actually exacerbate the impacts on the poor because mm -hmm. what they're going to do is take the poor away from the coastal areas and convert them into areas for tourism which means it's it's uh, going to probably improve the economic uh, profile but for a few you know high end hotels etc but in terms of the population of the city which is the grazers the fishers the people who are on the beach the people who use that as a commons that that kind of gets gets impacted so i i mean one of the things we've been coining which is a bit of a cheesy word but i think it makes sense is what we really need is ecologically smart cities and not technologically smart cities mm. in that sense that makes sense and i think one thing which is on everybody's mind uh, regarding climate change is of course we are seeing uh, rising temperatures uh, and lengthening of the summer so how are our cities going to be impacted by temperatures that's a hugely important question because most of the attention on cities and climate change so far has gone to flooding of coastal cities and of course that's very important 
but for countries like india the heat is going to be another huge killer and i'm using the word killer you know very realistically right. so for instance uh, you know some estimates say because of the combination of concrete like we are here you know you have urban heat island effects because the concrete hits back at you so the cities don't cool at night yes. the concrete holds the heat and the next day you get it gets even hotter and because of that combination you are not looking at a one and a half or two degrees rise you're looking at an eight to ten degrees centigrade Yikes. rise yeah eggs <laughs> so there's actually for instance there was a small town in rajasthan which in 2017 was so hot at 67 degrees the tar melted now can you imagine our cities which are already at 50 55 60 degrees if you have a city where the roads are impassable because tar has melted, melted. The, the city is crashed Yes. And then you add the effects of humidity. There's some research that now shows that in South India, where it is not going to get so hot, just a few percentage points greater in humidity, combined with a little, you know, a lower heat but added humidity, is going to, for instance, lead to a lot of uh, um, neonatal uh, mortality. That is the death of, you know, very tiny babies. Oh God! Yeah. So it, the, the effects, I think, of heat in Indian cities are going to be especially scary. And there's almost no attention on this. We're just talking about coastal flooding, coastal flooding. We're not talking about the heating impacts. So then what can be done to kind of adapt to this situation in a city? Again, we need uh, ecology and nature and nature-based solutions. You know, uh, for instance, there are some cities in India which have very good heat action plans. So Ahmedabad has this uh, very effective heat action plan, which is supposed to have really reduced the mortality during heat waves. But it's all about technology again. You have uh, cell phones with SMS alerts, which tell people to go away from the heat, and you have oh, okay. community centers. Right. But if you restored the water bodies of Ahmedabad, if you planted a lot of trees in those areas, then you would really reduce the temperatures also. And yes. we need to be working those kinds of things into this. Or for instance, instead of painting rooftops white, what if you had gardens on top of the rooftops? Yes. You'd give people food, you'd be multifunctional, and you'd cool the system. Yes. Right? So, which means, uh, you know, normally when we talk about ecology, we always think about forests or uh, marine ecosystems. But now it seems like urban ecology yeah. is becoming more and more important, right? And that's one thing we try to highlight in our new textbook also, where we have exactly. a whole chapter yeah. in, I think, biology on the urban scape, which is very unusual. So, what do you think will be the role of urban ecologists? I think that it's something we desperately need and I'm so glad to see that at least, you know, in terms of the kinds of people that you see, for instance, in the student conference on conservation science, yes. which happens in Bangalore every year, right? Yeah. You barely saw any urban ecologists. So now I'd say at least 30% of the people we see are doing urban ecology. Otherwise, ecologists like us always wanted to work in pristine environments, yes. distant forests, wild places. And of course, we love that. but. I think we are now realizing that there's ecology all around us and we probably have more of a chance to protect this ecology because we live here than anything else. Okay, so amen to that. <laughs> <laughs>